Here we go. If you've got a Bible, it's John chapter 13. And verse 34, 35. And it says this, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love, um, if you have love for one another. Um, do you know, um, everyone wants to know how to do church, okay? Everyone wants to know the formula, the pattern, the way of doing it, etc., etc. There's books out on it. There's um, lots of uh, different types of theology and lots of different types of viewpoints from different leaders. And there's lots of sermons out there. And um, But the, the thing is, is and, I th- and I believe that because I believe in church, I believe in this church, I believe that people will be knocking on the door because they'll see the things that God's doing. They'll hear the miracles what God's doing. They'll, they'll see the growth. They'll see uh, whatever's happening, the revival that we believe is coming. And they'll say, could you just tell me how to do this? And, and the thing is, 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 the truth is, it isn't as complicated as they make it or we make it. Because there is a book, but it's this one. It's this book. And in this book, it tells us everything that we need to know. And we don't need people to tell us their viewpoint on what church looks like or how it should be. Because God's already put it in his word. And Jesus speaks to his disciples at this point and he says, If you love one another as I love you, then people will know that you're my disciples. And in Acts 2, it says they gather together daily around various different acts, all the things that we think make us a Christian, praying and, and eating and, you know, but eating makes me a Christian. Um, and, um, and all those things that we get together praying, worshiping, um, getting around the word. And, um, and it says they were added to daily. I, if you really think about how the church grows, we could come up with the greatest evangelism programs in the world, but the church actually grows by just loving one another. And so if we could just learn how to love one another as Jesus loves us, do you know the world will want that? Because they'll just be like, I look, I looked at that, I look at them and look how they live, how they conduct themselves, how they treat each other, and the things that they do around the the things of the Lord. And and I want I want to be part of that. So sometimes we think we've got to have big, we've got to be like bold to go out on the streets, we've got to have like a big personality to be able to confidence go up to a stranger, but actually the truth of it is, is you just need to let Jesus in to your life, and then you just need to conduct yourself in a, a manner worthy of who he is, that people will see him in you, and that would be the greatest evangelistic tool you could ever come up with in your life. Just stand on him and let your example shine, and people will see him. Sometimes people want to make it more complicated. They say, well, surely it's to do with the programs. Surely you're growing because the worship team's decent or because the preacher's good or because the welcome team is, is, is a good, you've got a good setup or the kids' work that you've got. But the truth is, if people want to be part of this church, they want to come and be part of what's going on. It's because they want to be part of a family because everyone's looking for something to belong to and it needs to be him and then we get each other as a bonus. Love one another as I have loved you. So that's got nothing to do with my message. That's just, uh, yeah, me going off on a tangent. There you go. Um, so he commands them and he says, love them, love each other like I love you. Then um, a bit further on, a couple of verses, it says, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Because Jesus says, I'm off. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I won't be around with you guys forever. And Jesus answered, you cannot follow me now where I am going. Later you will. And Peter said to Jesus, why can I not come with you now? Like, why can't, I, can't, why can't, can't I come be with you all this time? Why can't I come with you now? And he says this, he says, I will die for you. So Peter goes up to Jesus and he, and he says, like, why can't I come with you? And then he says, because I'll die for you. Like, well, I, don't, I don't know where you're thinking you're going, Jesus, but I'll be with you every step of the way. Because Peter has been with Jesus every step of the way. Like, he's in every bit, isn't he? Every conversation, everything that comes up, every opportunity to step out, Peter is there, okay? And he's saying, yeah, I'll be there with you. I'll be there with you. I will die for you. And Jesus says, Peter, you'll die for me? For sure, I tell you, before the rooster crows, that basically means within 24 hours, you have, will have said three times, you do not know me. 
Like, basically, before another day breaks, like before, or be, be by the time the next day breaks, like, you're actually going to deny me. So you're here telling me you're going you're gonna to die for me, but actually you're going you're gonna to run away from me. That's what's going to happen. And, and Peter's sort of a bit confused by that. But because Jesus, what Jesus says uh, is true, uh, it says later we read, it says um, that Peter remembered the words Jesus spoke. So he's denied Jesus. Three different people came up to him, asked him, said, I'm pretty sure you're the guy that's hanging around with Jesus and all these things. And um, you're the guy that cut off my friend's ear and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he's like, oh, no, it wasn't me. I don't even know who that guy is. He's got nothing to do with me. So he went from saying he would die for Jesus to basically denying him so he could save his own life. But then he remembers, it says, he remembered the words Jesus had spoken about the rooster crowing and that he would be disowned Jesus three times. And then he went out and he wept bitterly. So we have a command, love one another as I have loved you, that they would know you're my disciples. Then um, you have the prediction of Jesus uh, telling uh, Peter he's going to uh, disown him. And then you, we know that Jesus, Peter does, basically. Okay? And, um, and this all happens. All this, this bit happens around the Lord's Supper. So uh, basically, it's all in like a condensed section. There's so much more to it. Like he washes their feet and, and all this. There's so much in there. And, and, um, but this, these, these are the bits I'm taking out. Because this story... I want, to, I want to, you to know is about Peter. And I want you to see um, yourself, hopefully, in the character of Peter. And at some, some point, it will speak to you about who God says you are. So John chapter 21. Jesus is alive. Okay, not to you, but to me he is. Okay, so Jesus is alive. Okay, brilliant. There we go. Um, <laughs> Jesus is alive. And... Um, so last week we learned that Jesus was in the tomb, yeah, and, um, and Jesus broke the seal, yeah. Um, does anyone remember the title of the message? Void if broken. There you go, that's good. Just checking. So void if broken, and um, Jesus was in the tomb, but he comes out of the tomb. And actually, here you go, here we are, he's come out of the tomb. And um, so all the things have been broken, if you needed that broken last week. But here's Jesus, and he's... He's, um, it says this, after all these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. Um, and in, in this way, he showed himself. Um, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And, uh, and he said to them, we're going to go with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And Jesus said to them, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because it's too much. There's too many fish. Therefore, the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits. It's about 100 yards, I think, or 200 yards, something like that. Um, so not very far, or meters, maybe. Um, dragging the net with fish. Then he, as soon as he had come to land, they saw a fire of coals and fish um, and, laid it, and laid on it and, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. So Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask who you are, knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Okay, um, so basically, um, they already know that Jesus is alive. I don't know if anyone knows this. This isn't Jesus' first encounter with the disciples. The, Jesus has already met with many of the disciples already, and and um, and he's and they are and if he hasn't met with all of them, they already know through their friends, their disciples, that he's alive. Basically, they know he's alive. There's something going on. So Peter. Knowing that Jesus is alive, knowing that he's around, there's something going on, decides to go back to his old life. He decides to just say, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go back to, to what I did before. 
And I, and I, and I, I want to kind of, I don't know if anyone's ever read this differently, but I believe um, there's a different um, motivation in, in what Peter is doing here um, to what maybe we could, we may, maybe have read or thought. So, um, so Peter, he says, we're going fishing. They say they're going to go with him. Um, uh, when we did this a few weeks back from, um, from now on, um, we learned that Simon went fishing. And uh, how much did he catch? He caught nothing. And, um, and so there's two instances of Simon fishing in the Bible. This is the second one. And he went out and he went fishing. And he caught nothing. He's not a very good fisherman. Yeah, he's really not a good fisherman. Um, and um, so he goes, out, he, catch, he goes out to catch fish. They catch nothing. And then this voice comes from the beach basically saying, have you, have you got anything yet? And uh, they're like, no. And then he says, why don't you cast the net to the right? And they do. And then they catch all these fish. And then, it's, then it says this, therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, I don't know, but how, mu- how many little things did Jesus have to do to reveal himself to Peter or any of them before they actually thought that's Jesus? Peter didn't even come to the conclusion it was Jesus himself. He had to have someone actually tell him it was Jesus. So do you think he was on there going, uh, Okay, guy on the beach has told us to put the net on the other side, whatever. You know, I think I've done that before somewhere. I can't remember ringing a bell. So he throws the net on the other side, and then, and then, uh, and, then um, and then all these fish fill, fill up the net, and he's like, and the boat's like this, and he's like, I th- I th- this, this reminds me of something. And then John's there pulling in the fish, and he's going, like Peter, Peter, and he's like, John, like shut up a minute. This is reminding me of something. It's reminding me of something. I just don't know what it is. And, um, and, then, and then they pull the fish in, and then he's, and John's like, it's Jesus. And I think this passage of Scripture, you may not read it like this, but if you have read it like this, I think this passage of Scripture is misinterpreted. It says that John says it's Peter, and then um, he says, now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his coat. I've got my coat today. You've had acting, now you've got props. <laughs> so uh, here we go. Let's get that going. And uh, puts on his coat, and it says he plunged into the sea. When you go to, uh, when you go to, the, uh, to the sea, usually if you're going to jump into a swimming pool, you're going to jump into the sea, you usually take more clothes off, not put more clothes on. But Peter actually puts his coat on. Okay, so he puts his coat on, and he's uh, like this. And he, it says he plunges into the sea. And it says, this is a dumb thing to do, all right? Because they're actually not that far away from the sea. I can't see anything. But um, they're not actually that far away. So he's actually going to take longer to get back himself. Okay? And, and um, so get out there. There you go. And um, he's... He's actually going to take longer to get to Jesus. We look at it as like he goes, it's Jesus. I didn't work that one out. It's Jesus, right. He puts on his clothes and he dives in to swim really fast to get to to Jesus first. Because that is the Peter that we know and read in the Bible, isn't it? The one that's always first. The one that's always wanting to get there or get the right answer or step out first. And we can read this. As if it's saying that he puts on the coat and he jumps in. And I think we didn't even read that he put on a coat. I think we just think, whoa, look at Peter. He's so excited that it's Jesus. He dives into the sea and he swims to Jesus. It doesn't even say that he gets to Jesus. It doesn't say any of that stuff. It just says he puts on his coat and dives into the water. And it says the other guys row next to him thinking, what is he doing? Okay, and then they get there to the beach and they, and they get to Jesus. They go to Jesus. And Jesus says, bring some of that fish over and we'll cook it for breakfast. So here he is with his coat on, he's, he's like this. and he's jumped in the sea, and he's probably got to the beach, and Jesus is there, and he's sat down. All the other guys have already arrived, and they're sat around Jesus, and he's doing some cooking, and he's chatting like Jesus would be chatting. Now, do you want a Bible study? Uh, what's it called? Yeah, a Bible study. Petra and I love Bible studies, don't you? You like Bible study? You ready? Okay. So, when you do Bible study, 
and you look up a word in um, an original language, like Greek or Hebrew, Hebrew for the old, Greek for the new, um, a lot of the time there's a word in there that we can then translate to um, somewhere else where it's said somewhere else in the word of God. And then that helps us to get sort of like an understanding of what, what the meaning is. So when I look up this, where it says he put on his garment and jumped into the sea, um, it actually doesn't have any other reference for that word garment other than it's one meaning. It means fishing coat. So he put on a fishing coat. That's basically all it means. He put on his Mac. And, and that's not really helpful when you're doing a Bible study because you think there's got to be a reason why he put his coat on. There has to be. There always is a purpose and a meaning in Scripture. But like for me, so I studied this for a while, looked into it. And then I was able, I didn't know I could do this, but you're able to link Greek and Hebrew words together. Do you know that? So when you link the, the, um, the word that's in the Hebrew with the word that's in the Greek, you can get a meaning for garment in the Hebrew, which means the same thing. Um, it's just a different word. Um, and it gets us to a word that's called, it's called ma'el. Do you want to say that to the person next to you? Ma'el. Okay, so it doesn't really make sense that he puts a coat on and dives into the sea, does it? It doesn't make sense, okay? It, it doesn't make sense that for a guy that loves Jesus, has always been by Jesus' side, wouldn't actually take the quickest route to get there. That doesn't make sense. But we read it as if he did take the quickest route, thinking, oh, he must have got there first. But actually, if you read the scripture, I don't think that's the case. Because a little bit further on, it says, um, Jesus says, bring some of the fish. And it says, Simon Peter went and got the net. It doesn't say Simon Peter and the disciples. So it sounds to me that he gets there later. And then he's walking, Jesus is there on the beach. And it sounds to me that Peter's like, I'll get the fish. Like this. And he's dragging it in by himself. All these fish, dragging them in. It even says that you know, they know how many. It says that it actually says there was 153 fish. I don't know why anyone counted fish. But that could have been Peter because he's thinking, I just need to do something else. So maybe I'll just count the fish. Maybe that's why that is documented in there. But when you know the meaning of the word ma'el, you know what he's doing. Because the meaning of the word ma'el means to cover having committed a trespass against God. So when he puts his coat on, he's covering his shame. Because we already just learned the story that he had denied Jesus. He said he would die for him, but when he had the opportunity three times, he didn't take that option. He ran, and he denied his Lord and Savior. And so here is Peter at the, at, at the opportunity to be with the one that he loves the most, the one that he's always hung around, the one that changed his life. And, and he hasn't jumped out quickly to get there. He's jumped out to get there slowly. And he put his coat on to weigh him down more. And he's put his coat on because it's a, a sign of wearing your shame so you can hide. You know, like kids do today, they can put their hoodies on and walk around and no one has to make eye contact with them and stuff like that. And that's what's happened here is that Peter is covering up his shame. He was avoiding Jesus. Read it. Go away and read it for yourself. Actually look at it. What was Peter doing? Was it, does it say Peter was the first? Peter was, Jesus, what fish shall we use? Oh, Jesus was, he was like, Jesus, you're here. I knew it. I knew that you would. You know, I'm so sorry that I let you down, but here I am. Uh, and he's like, it doesn't say any of that. It says the opposite. It says Peter took the longest route, and then he actually just went and carried some fish, rather than actually be with Jesus. Church, I want to say to you that there are people here today that you run around on the outskirts of your relationship with Jesus. You cover yourself in shame. You hide from him rather than to him. You, you, rather than go and sit with him, rather than to spend time in fellowship with him, to listen to his voice, you're, you, there's something that's happened in your life that has meant that you're wearing something that's keeping you away from him. And you're on the outside of uh, your relationship with Jesus. You're doing everything but where you need to be. You need to be with him, but you're, instead you're counting fish. Instead, you're taking the long route, route, route to get to him. You're slowing yourself down to get there. Peter was covering up his shame. When we, when we go on to read, um, it says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
And then he says to him a third time, and then he says to him, tend my sheep. Then he says to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, uh, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you stretched out your hands and, and another will gird and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now in English, how do you spell the word love? How do you spell the word love if to say I love my wife? How do you spell the word love if you're saying I love chocolate? How do you spell the word love if you're saying I love fast cars? How do you spell the word love if you want to say I love uh, Manchester United? <laughs> L-O-V-E. The unfortunate thing that we have in our language is we have many, many um, parts of the word where one word is all we've got in English. But in Hebrew and Greek, there are many different versions of that word. So the word love in, um, in Hebrew and in, in Greek has many meanings. It's broken down into different levels. You can have love for friendship, love for God's love, and there's other things like love for stuff. And there's, and there's different, um, different meanings to the word love. So if you were reading this passage with the story about Jesus saying, do you love me, do you love me, do you think maybe the greatest theologist out there looked at it and went, I could tell you what that is immediately. He denied him three times, so he said to him three times. I think that's it. I've nailed it. There you go. You've got it for free. But the truth of it is, is as much as there might be a, mo a purpose within that to link to the three times that Jesus was denied by Peter, for Jesus to ask him three times just as a, as a way, that, that isn't actually what's being said in this passage. So there are two versions of the word love in this passage. One is agapeo, which is actually the root of the word agape, which everyone does use, but actually agapeo is actually the right meaning for that. So if you look it up, um, it means this. It means preferring to live through Christ, embracing God's will, choosing his choices, and obeying them through his power. It means actively doing what the Lord prefer prefers with him by his power and direction. That is like agapeo love. The agape love that we talk about, agapeo love, this is the love that Jesus was talking about before with his disciples. Can you love one another with a love that you will love one another, you will support one another, you will stand with each other, that you would follow my commandments together, that you would do my will, and that you wouldn't move out of that. And then there's another version of love, which is filio, which is basically affectionate friendship. Shows warm affection in an intimate friendship. So look, here we go. Jesus says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape or agapeo love me more than these? Do you love me with everything that you have, Peter? Do you love me like I love you? Do you love me with, with an attitude that you're willing to die with me, to die for me? Do you love me that way? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Filio love. What's it, say in your, what's it say in your Bible? Does it just say L-O-V-E? And does it say L-O-V-E on the line before it? So when we read that, we, it's just, well, okay, whatever, this is weird. But when you read it in the, in the original language, Jesus is saying, do you love me with everything that you have, Peter? And Peter's like, Jesus, you know that I love you like a friend. And he says, feed my lambs. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you, you know that I love you as a friend. And he says, tend to my sheep. And he says to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? But this time, this time, Jesus doesn't say to him, do you love me with everything that you have? He says, do you love me as a friend, Peter? Do you love me with just an, as an affectionate friend? Do you love me in that way? And Peter says, yes, Jesus, because that's all I've got. That's all I've got for you right now. That's all I've got for you. Because at that moment, 
And the reason he's wearing his jacket and the reason he tried to stay away from Jesus and he, and he was staying on the fringes of what Jesus was doing is because he is carrying a coat of shame. He's walking in shame. And, and, and so he, he thought that he had the agapeo love in that room with Jesus when Jesus said, I've got to leave you. And he says, no, I'll die for you, Jesus. He thought he had that love. He thought he had the love that Jesus had commanded him to have with his brothers, his disciples. He thought that he had that love. But when it really came down to the crunch, when he, when he got to the first opportunity to be questioned whether he was going to be a follower of Jesus that could lead him to his death, he ran. And not only once, but three times he had that opportunity. And so he, he is avoiding Jesus because he's carrying a shame. He's carrying the shame of realizing that he thought that he was willing to die for Jesus, but when it came to the crunch, he wasn't. So when Jesus is saying, do you love me with everything you've got, Peter? Peter's saying, Jesus, I can't love you with everything I've got. I've let you down. I, I haven't got that in me because I denied you. And all I have is this love. I've got love, but not the love you're asking me. I can't, haven't got the sacrificial love that you have for me. I haven't got that in me, and I'm ashamed of it. And I'm wearing this coat because of it. I'm wearing this, this coat of shame because of it. You see, the start of this message was about Jesus commanding them to love one another as he had loved them so that people would know that they are the disciples. Peter knew that he hadn't done that, that he hadn't lived with the, with the love that Jesus um, was asking of him. Okay. So here's Peter, he's in shame. Do you know what I love about Jesus is he does this thing. I can't sit next to you, you've got a Bible. Let's sort of try next to Daisy. He does this thing and he says, he says, where you're at, Daisy? And you go, I'll do your voice. Well, Rich, or let's say Jesus because we're talking to Jesus, all right? Well, Lord, I'm actually having a bit of a tough time right now. Your voice is a bit deep, I'm sorry. Um, well, Lord. I'm having a bit of a tough time right now, and uh, actually, I can't, <laughs> Mickey. I can't actually love you the way you want me to love you, God. I'm struggling with that. What I love about Jesus is He doesn't say, "You need to love me with the love I love you, love you with." What is wrong with you? Come on, pull yourself together. He says, "Can you love me the way that you can? Can you? Can you? I'm here right now, talking to you where you're at, and your love is at this place." You've got filio love right now. You just love me as a friend. And I want you to love me with this sacrificial love. But right now, I'm meeting you where you're at. And I understand that's where you're at. But this is where we're going. This is where we're going. And that's what he does with, that's what he does with Peter. He meets Peter where he's at and he says, okay, Peter, I get it. I get it. What you've done, where you've been, has led you to the place to come to the conclusion that you can give nothing else but that. Because you feel you've let me down so much. That there's, that's all you can give. That's all you've got. And he, but then he meets him where he's at. He just says, okay, I get it. But I'm not here. Jesus says, I'm not here to talk about what you did. I'm not here to talk about, about what you've done wrong. I'm here to talk about where we're going. He, I'm here to tell you that actually you will love me with an agape of love. Because... I died for you, and I tell you what, let me just tell you a little bit about your future. So Jesus says, I get it. I know where you're at right now. I get it. But let me tell you about your future. Let me tell you that even though you're not where you think you need to be with God right now, God wants to remind you of your future. He isn't a God that reminds us of our past. He wants to remind you of where you're going, not where you were. And he's not saying to Peter, did you, uh, did you hear the cock crow? Did you, Peter? He doesn't do that with him. He's not reminding him of his shame. He's not reminding him of the mistakes he's made. He's there to meet. This whole encounter is all about Peter. Jesus is cooking breakfast for Peter. He's doing this to meet with Peter to set him free. Peter was in shame. He was wearing the coat and he decided to go back to his old life. Not because he was good at it, because we know he wasn't, but because he had nothing else. He couldn't live the life that he thought he was going to live for Jesus because he had made such a mistake. He had let God down so much that there was no way back for him. And he was just going back to what he knew. Jesus was on the earth at that point and he knew it. 
remember that. He wasn't just going back to what he knew because he thought Jesus was dead. He knew Jesus was alive. And he still went back to what he knew because he was in such shame. Maybe there's some people here, maybe some people that will be watching later that are maybe in such shame that you feel there is no way back for you with God. I want to say that's an absolute lie because God does not remind us of our past. He points to our future. And he reminds Peter of his future. He says, okay, I'm asking you to love me with an everlasting sacrificial love. And you're telling me that you haven't got that in you. But let me just tell you this. He says, Jesus, feed my sheep. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And he said, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you were old, you stretched out your hands and another would gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. By what death he would glorify God. Jesus was saying, you may be wearing a coat of shame that says you can't die for me, but I'm telling you your future says you will. So let's, let's lift off. Let's lift off that sh- jacket. Let's get rid of that jacket. Let's take that off for good, Peter, because you can't carry that anymore. You can't walk around in, in, that, in this jacket anymore. This jacket of shame needs to come off. The things you've done in the past are gone. There might be consequences. There are sometimes. But God is not there reminding you of your past. He wants to remind you of your future. He wants to say, if you can follow me, there is a future for you. And the shame that you're carrying around with you right now doesn't need to be worn because I want to lift it off. Turn to the person next to you and say, lift off. Lift off. See, Peter was in shame because he was not willing to die for Jesus. And he tried to cover up that shame. And Jesus says, let me take that shame from you because you will. One of the greatest things that you'll ever do in your whole life that people will know you for is you will die for me like I have died for you. Church, what a love that is to have for God. That we are willing to lay down our lives. Jesus is not talking about where we're at right now. He's talking about where we can be. It's time to lift off. It's time to take off the jacket of shame, to take away um, whatever it is that you're carrying and walking around with that's stopping you from connecting with God and getting into a relationship with God. It needs to be lifted off. You see, Isaiah 64, 6, it says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. For all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind take us away. When we do it our way, church, that coat that we wear is filthy. It's filthy. We wear a filthy garment when we do things in our own strength and we do it according to our way. See, Peter thought Jesus was going to be something different. He had a different expectation of who God was and who Jesus was. Despite the fact that Jesus told him very clearly who he was, what he was going to do and and what was going to happen to him. Peter just had in his mind that he was there to release them from um, a Roman reign. But the truth of it was, he was there to set the captive free, free, full stop. He wasn't there just to set a group of people free from a regime. He was there to set the whole world free from a regime, from the world, from the way the world lives, from the, 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 the path that we can take, the wide path that we can live. He was there to set the captive free. And Peter didn't understand that. Until this moment, I think. He didn't understand the gospel until this moment because he thought it was about what he did. He thought it was about where he he did good. He was getting a pat on the back. I walked on water. Do you know that? And uh, and uh, and all these other things. I was the first one to answer some of the questions. He felt like that was his value was that getting there first or being the one that volunteers. He'd be that person and, and that might make him something. So when he let Jesus down, when he made the mistake, he was like, oh my gosh, God is judging me on what I do. And I've done bad. So he must hate me. I'm gonna, he, must, he must despise me. He can't stand me because, like, because of what I've done to him. You know, I was thinking about this. We think that we can let God down. I want to say to you today, you are not that powerful. You can't let God down. Do you know that? You're not powerful enough to let God down. God's in the mood with me today. Is he really? Is he? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't just suddenly gone, I've become this God of wrath because you, uh, you, you, know, you decided not to pray this morning. 
You know when you get like you're walking and you get a puddle hit you because you thought, oh, I should have read my Bible this morning. Of course not there moving things around. Like, do you know what I mean? Like going, oh, right. You thought that you'd uh, stay in this morning and sleep in, did you? Well, I'm going to, there's the bus. You missed it. And uh, that's not the God that we serve. He's not a God there moving things about. Like angry God just going like, okay, they didn't do what they wanted me to do. He's not insecure. He's not there going like, oh, they let me down this morning. Let me show you them. Let me show you what I've got now. He loves you. He loves you. And actually, he just loves the fact that you've got the idea to pray in the morning. Yes, we could get up and do that. But he loves the fact that it's even on your mind. The fact that the conviction is there to think, man, I should have done that. He loves that. He definitely loves it more probably when you're in that, you know, when you're doing it with him, because he gets to spend more time with you and speak to you and you get to, to hear from him. But he's not sat there going like, no, nah, a, here's a list. Do the list, we'll be fine. You can't let God down. And I, and I think, like, we're, like I said, we're not that powerful. So here's Peter carrying it, thinking, "Man, Jesus must like, man, I, I had the opportunity to to die alongside him, and instead here I am. You know, wearing my coat, and and I can't even get near him. I can't even be near him." Have you ever been in so much shame with God that you can't actually, you just feel so far away from him? You know, Jesus wants to lift off that shame from you. Could I have, could I just have a couple of volunteers? Let's have four. Could I have four people? Be quick. Don't all rush at once. It's not going to be too super scary. You're all right. You don't have to wear it. You don't have to put it on because that was a bit of a nightmare getting on. Let's start with you, Nath. All right, so just you can put it over your shoulder. Right? I'm like, jumping around, aren't I? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, basically, we, we've, got, um, we've got a God that wants to lift off, yeah? We've got a God that wants to lift off your shame. He wants to lift off the things that are reminding you of your past. He wants it lifted off of you. But also a God that puts on. Okay. So here we have, you are wearing, you're wearing the garment of shame because you thought you got saved a few years ago and you've let God down since. This is a bit real. <laughs> sorry, 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 don't cry, don't cry. And you've let God down and you're, and you're walking in shame because the salvation you thought that you had, you didn't have, or was it your own? And you're walking around and you're just like, mm, you know, I'm not walking around um, anymore the way God wants me to. I'm not living a life that God wants me to live anymore. I, I, I've let him down along the way. And I'm, I should be here and I'm, I'm not there. Like Peter, I'm not where God wanted me to be. I let him down along the way. And you're wearing this garment, this garment of shame because you've let God down with your salvation. But God wants to, what's he want to do? He wants to lift off. He wants to lift off. And he wants to, these are, you can put that on now. And he wants to, um, I'm going to get these wrong, so Mary is going to tell me off. But he wants to put on. <laughs> it's all right. It's not, I know it's a bit girly. But. <laughs> but this is in the word. He wants to put on the garment of salvation. So he wants to take off the shame. <laughs> he wants to take off the shame. That's beautiful. You're on live. Um, so uh, he wants to take off the garment of salvation. And you, yeah, yeah you're, you're a broken man. Probably a bit close to home. So um, you're a broken man, and you're in a place where, like, you're inside. You're just you're just crumbling apart. And and even though you know God is Lord is Lord, He is God. That actually inside you're you no one sees what's going on. And even on the outside, you can show what you need to show, and you can play the bass in a spectacular fashion, and all these things that you can do. That actually inside you're rotting, and actually inside that you're just a broken mess, and yet you're walking around before God with a coat of shame because you're broken and God wants to take that off of you today and he he wants to put on the garment of healing which actually works out quite incredible for what you're going through right now okay there you go Daisy and you're wearing you're wearing the garment you're wearing the garment you're wearing the one that's the filthy rags you're wearing the one that where you've been trying to do it 
in your own strength, you think you have a relationship with God, that if you do everything the way that you think he wants you to do it, that that will get you to where he wants you to be. But every now and then you slip up and you realize, oh my gosh, God must hate me right now because I'm in a, I'm in a relationship with God where he works it, where I do well, he's happy with me. When I do bad, he hates me. And so you're walking around with a garment of um, where you're doing it in your own strength. And God wants to take off that garment and he wants to put on this one. And he wants to put that garment on. Sorry, Margie, there we go. And he wants to put on this garment, which is the garment of righteousness. Because his righteousness is not in what we do. In fact, there's nothing that we can do to obtain it or earn it. His righteousness is only in him. And so when we walk around with that filthy garment on because we're trying to do it our way, that also leads us to a place when we let him down to realize that we've fallen so far short of God's standard that we've made up in our own heads that we now feel rubbish about ourselves and we walk around in shame because we're carrying this thing that we're not good enough. We can't obtain God's love. Do you know what I did this week? He could never love me. Well, it was never about you in the first place. It was about him dying for you and that he died for you so that you don't have to do it and that you haven't got to work at it. It's a free gift. So the garment of righteousness and you, Margie, you put it on properly. Um, you, Margie, you're in a place where your life has been so tough and so hard that as you've gone through life, yes, there's a God. You've been following God. I've gone to church and, and I, I have the revelation of who Jesus is, but actually so much has happened to me that I can't even praise God anymore. That I just can't even, I can't even say that God is a good God because so much bad has happened to me that you walk around in a coat of shame because you know that you should and you know it's the right thing to do. But the problem is, is that whatever's happened to you in your life is causing you to walk around in shame and that you can't shake that shame because you're walking around with this garment that's condemning you for what's happened to you. But God wants to take that coat off. So we just take that coat off. Do you want to help us? All right, wants to take that off. And he wants to put on you the garment of praise. He wants to put on you the garment of praise. You see, God wants to lift off. But God doesn't finish there. He wants to put on. And he wants you guys to put these things on. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the cloak of righteousness and the gift of salvation. Put these things on, the cloak of healing. Wear them. Don't wear the shame. Let it be lifted off of you today. And let God pour on you the right cloaks, the right ones. There's so many of them, so many garments in the word of God that you can put on. Healing, righteousness, garments of praise. You don't need to walk around in that anymore. You guys can go sit down. You can, uh, that, no, it's Mary, so you can ask Mary. Um, but thank you. Should we give them a round of applause? Well done. <laughs> thank you, guys. The garment of salvation, the garment of healing, the garment of righteousness, the garment of praise. God wants to take off the garment of shame, and he wants to put on these garments. He wants to lift off, and he wants to put on. So, church, I want to say to you today that if you're here in a place, or you know people that are, that are walking around with the wrong coat on, that they are avoiding Jesus and they're skirting around or you are and you're walking around the fringes of a relationship with him because you know that when you get there, you feel like shame is going to come, but that isn't Jesus. Jesus did not make a spectacle of Peter. He even says he took Peter to one side. He doesn't say, oh, uh, did anyone know what Peter did when uh, I was on getting arrested? Does anyone know that? Do you know how Peter let me down? But we have a preconceived view of how God is going to shame us in front of people, but that is not our God. He takes us to one side and he loves on us and he says, I know where you're at right now. You might only feel like this, but that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to remind you of where you're going. And church, Jesus wants to remind you today that he's here to say you have a future. You have a future. Stop living in your past. Stop letting that dictate who you are, where you, where you go, what you've done to let him down in your own mind, what you think you've done. It, it doesn't stop him from loving you. It doesn't stop him from offering his hand. It doesn't stop him from being able to reconnect with you. It's you that's wearing the wrong coat 
that stops you reconnecting with him. You need to let him lift that off and you need to let him pour on his garments. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's time to lift off. Hi guys, thanks for watching this video. Um, please click subscribe to find out more about the Hillfields Church YouTube channel or go to our website to connect with us. Love you guys.